but first of all, um, welcome everybody and all welcome back. Um, so really pleased to have the next uh, Convergence lecture um, and very, uh, very pleased to uh, welcome Ana Matamala, who is uh, based in uh, Barcelona. Um, as uh, well, I guess some of you have seen it, but I would like to say it anyway. So Anna is um, uh, Anna is an associate professor at the Universita um, Autonoma in Barcelona, and um, works and has worked for quite some time uh, on audio description as part of audiovisual translation and uh, and uh, media accessibility, if you like. Um, if you have uh, had the opportunity to look around, you will uh, immediately notice Anna has a has a stellar track record um, in this um, area of research, um, a prolific author and co-author in this area. Anna has um, led uh, several um, uh, collaborative projects and also been part of collaborative projects, European projects, national projects, which um, are well known to some of us. And uh, in addition, of course, Anna is also well known to us for being involved in organizing conference, well-known conferences, regular conferences, the Media for All conference, the Advanced Research Seminar in Audio Description, the RSAT. Um, and I will say that uh, one of the things I didn't know, Anna, is that um, uh, you have well, you have been awarded several prizes for your work, and you've actually been awarded a, a prize in 2021, the uh, Dr. Margaret Fanstiel um, Memorial Achievement Award in Audio Description Research and Development. Um, those of you who know audio description will know immediately that Margaret Fanstiel was a, a very, very early pioneer of um, audio description practice in the theater, and I I think we can say she she was part of kickstarting all of this and um, in America and so it is. Um, I was uh, very pleased to see that you have been awarded the prize. So many congratulations, Anna. Um, so in in her talk today, um, Anna will give us an overview of the audio description related research that she and her group has been uh, carried out. Um, sorry, that is the uh, um, the uh, Transmedia Catalonia group, which Anne is, Anna is uh, chairing. I forgot to say that, sorry. And um, yes, it's an overview of the work that has been carried out. So I, I, I look forward to every part of this. This will be very rich. And um, I also look forward to hearing Anna's thoughts um, sort of about conceptualizing the, the rich outcomes of this work, um, especially conceptualizing this relationship between um, technology and accessibility and audio description that, that Anna has been working on. So looking very much forward to it and uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the kind words. When you see so many things, it means that I'm growing old, that's for sure. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, th thanks, thanks for, the, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here online. Uh, I, I will be talking indeed about researching audio description, but I'll, in fact, when I started preparing the talk, I opened a bit the lens. So you will see that I will deal uh, with some more general aspects, and then I'll put examples from the audio description field. Okay. Um, if you need to interrupt me, if you want to interrupt me, that's not a problem at all. And if someone wants to follow the presentation online, you need to make it bigger for whatever reason. Uh, it's already available in open access. The link is ddd.uab.cat. So ddd.uab.cat slash record slash 255991. Okay, so I know that some people like to download the PDFs and then you have all the, all the content there. And if not, you can go back to the presentation later and download it. Um, I have this policy of putting everything in open access, uh, even you know if it's a, a, a short talk or a presentation, but I think it's good to have this, this habit. Um, the second thing I want to say um, is that this is not my work. Okay, this is the work that we've been doing in Transmedia Catalonia Research Group. We are a research group uh, based at the Universitat Autonoma in Barcelona. I am leading it now, but uh, for a long time, it was led by Pilar Oredo, uh, and she's still involved in the group as a European project uh, leader. So we, we started the group in 2005, 
and we've been working mainly on the field of media accessibility. Uh, actually, our background is on audiovisual translation. And actually, my background is in applied linguistics. And Sabine, I still remember, sorry for the informal talk, in 2007, we were at a conference in Portugal, and we were discussing a lot, it was the beginning, no? and we came from applied linguistics. And it's nice to see how how we are evolving, in my case, from translation and applied linguistics to audiovisual translation, to media accessibility, to accessible communication. Um, when going Constantin offered this talk, I was very worried because I said, I'm gonna be repeating myself. Uh, I cannot prepare something innovative in one month or three weeks. So uh, he said, don't worry about that. So I'll try to give it maybe a different approach, but of course, uh, some of the content I'm presenting here has been published, has been presented. So some of you may know about part of it, but that's why I, I hope that even so, you will all take home something which is interesting for, for you. I've structured my, my talk uh, on three main topics. When I, when I was thinking, when I was you know, reflecting on what the pillars of our research are uh, at Transmedia Catalonia, I thought, Users are always there. Users are central in our research. I also thought that technology has guided us in all the different projects that we've uh, led or we've participated in, but also in a way we're striving for innovation. Okay, We're striving to uh, research new things. For instance, when we started researching audio description, I remember that nobody was almost researching that. There were practitioners, but not as a research field. So this is the way I've structured my talk. And of course, there will be some elements which are very basic and know to some of you, then maybe there will be some uh, other more specific things. When, when we deal with users, um, in, in our research projects at Transmedia Catalonia, we normally are involved in European projects in which we try to adopt what we call a user-centric methodology. So very often we are not involved in projects on accessibility only or on audiovisual translations. We are involved in projects on other topics in which we try to add this accessibility layer. Because for me, and that's an important thing, what's, in, what's interesting is that we can find accessibility in different fields of research. We can always add that and we can always research that in different contexts. But to research that, we need the users. So our investigations are always user-centric. So we normally work with engineers who develop some products some services, some prototypes, etc. And very often we are take care of the user interaction of the user evaluation. So Normally, what we try to follow is this user-centric methodology in which we want to gain an explicit understanding of the users, the tasks, and the environment. They, we want them to be involved through this design and development process. Uh, we want to have user-centric evaluations in an iterative way. Uh, and to do that, we have to work with teams of engineers, with teams of other disciplines, which is challenging and enriching, I would say. And uh, also we try to adopt what is a clear, but at the same time, flexible approach to user testing. Um, so very often what we do in our projects is start from the user needs. And we do that with focus groups very often with users. We gather requirements. So what the users need in relation to a certain service or product, then the technical partners develop these technical specifications they are implemented. And here you can imagine whatever, uh, uh, software, a tool, uh, a service. And then what we do is evaluate it with users. And then once we get the evaluation from the users, uh, we start this iterative uh, cycle of evaluation so that the tool, the service, whatever can be improved. When doing that, very often we ask ourselves who the users are. And when we started, we were following uh, what I would call a medical uh, model. So we said, all, even we said uh, audio description for the blind, uh, audio uh, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, okay? So we 
normally said, okay, or the description or the introduction and touch tours are for the blind or partially sighted, audio subtitling uh, for the blind and persons with dyslexia, for instance, uh, SDH, as the name says, for the deaf and hard of hearing. And then related to this, but not as an access services within the broader perspective of audiovisual translation, we would say dubbing voiceover and subtitling are for persons who do not understand the language. But does this model still stand? Uh, I'm sure many of you have been uh, reading SDH subtitles on, uh, a, on a metro or while, you know, even in class, I'm sure some of the students do. Uh, uh, with maybe you're cooking and you're listening to a, a, an audio described movie. Um, so there are many, many situations in which you may need an access service or an audiovisual transfer mode. Um, so the people who need that are persons who cannot understand the language, persons who cannot access the visuals, and the visuals can be images or the written text, persons who cannot access the sounds, be them linguistic or non-linguistic. I mean, if I'm watching a movie in, I don't know, Japanese, it doesn't matter if I hear that, I, I will not understand a thing. So I need a, an access service, an audiovisual translation mode in this case. And also maybe uh, we need to think of the people who are struggling to understand the content. And this is often forgotten. And the reasons can be very different. It can be due to a disability, but also the circumstances, etc., etc. I know this is very basic. Many of you already know about this, but it's good to remind us of this in of this because then we need to ask ourselves who are we going to test with maybe we prioritize the primary audiences okay that's fine the blind and partially sighted are the persons with sight loss are a primary audience and this is why we want to test with them but it's worth thinking about these issues that's that's my whole point and also another thing is that if what we are developing or what we are testing wants to take a universal design approach so that we want to develop something for everybody, maybe it's worth testing this thing with different user profiles, okay? I don't have a solution that fits all the circumstances, but my point is maybe we need to go beyond this disability uh, model, and I'll get to this point in a, in a second. I've been referring to end users so far, okay? But also in our research very often, we may deal with other user profiles. So not only the people who will be using the subtitles or the audio descriptions, but maybe some of you are doing research with those who create these access services, who distribute, who procure, who teach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it's it's important to to be aware that when you deal with all these users, there may be factors, as I was saying before, that affect the results even more than disability per se. I, I remember when we started doing research on subtitles, for instance, uh, we had users with hearing loss, okay? And that was the, the most important thing in our test. It was a medical model, but maybe the reading ability or something more important than actual the hearing loss. And there can be a correlation, but not always, okay? So uh, also I remember that we did test with, uh, Alex, I'll get to that in a second, with uh, VR, virtual reality. And, and, or sometimes that we do test with a technological component, the familiarity with the tools, the familiarity with the technology may have sometimes a bigger impact than the actual uh, disability. Um, also the habit, of course, the reading, the watching, the access service usage habits. So there are many factors that when we design our studies, we need to consider and, and take into account. I know that sometimes it's really complex that we cannot take care of absolutely everything, but uh, even in our studies, we don't, sometimes it's not possible to, to, to have a huge sample. So. We need to be sometimes a bit more practical, but it's something that we need to really think about because maybe the models are changing. We come from this medical uh, disability model. We moved to a social model in which we said, okay, 
the problem in inverted commas is not in the disability, but on the society. But I think we are even moving forward to a capability based model, uh, which has been this developed by Sophie Mitra using uh, Martha Nausbaum and Amart Piazan's capability approach uh, that says that health deprivation is a necessary but not a sufficient ingredient for a disability. So depending on your abilities, on your circumstances, on what the society gives you, etc., uh, you may be able to do something or you may not be able to do uh, something. Um, as I said, when, when, I'm, when we are involved in European projects, we try always to start with a user categorization, very broad user categorizations that are shared among the many partners that are involved. I uh, think that in this European projects, there are people from different backgrounds, different knowledges, different expertise. So finding a shared uh, language, a shared terminology, finding, for instance, a shared user categorization is a very useful step from the beginning. And I can imagine that if you do your own research, PhD, postdoc, it's always fundamental to define your, your users. Um, so for instance, just two examples, Interaction, it's a, a European project in which we are dealing with artistic co-creation. So something totally different, just as an example, okay? Um, we are co-creating opera, professionals and non-professionals. So for instance, in Ladia, they are co-creating an opera in a prison with inmates. In Barcelona, Liceo Opera House is co-creating an opera with neighbors from the area. Ireland, INO, Irish National Opera, is co-creating a virtual reality opera with different communities, in Ismail, et cetera, et cetera. So when we started this project, uh, we all refer to these you know, participants in a different way. Participants, users, audiences, because we all came from different backgrounds. So the, one of the first things we did was clarify who are the participants and how we would categorize and relate to them. It's not so important the categorization there, I will not get into that, it's a concept. In a similar way, in the project we are in, I'm involved now, I will explain it a bit later. It's about creating a, a platform using blockchain technology in which users can create content. Uh, we defined a very basic user categorization. So the user can be an administrator, a manager, a producer, a consumer. Uh, you may think this is simple. Yes, it's simple, but it was not simple to get to this simple categorization. Very often, the most, you know, the simplest categorizations are the most difficult to reach because it means, you know, breaking down and simplifying everything and agreeing among different partners. So my advice related to users, and this is broader, as you see, is uh, try to, you know, it's if you develop something, always try to involve users. Um, in our case, it works very much to involve users through user associations. Uh, that's really, really useful. Um, I, of course, let's follow ethical procedures. I'm sure you are all aware of it, but still I get surveys from time to time. Please take part in this survey. And I see where are the ethical, you know, uh, requirements, no ethics. So please take that into account in your projects, be them PhD projects, postdoc or national European projects. And then another advice from my experience is that let's not forget users once the once our research is done. And this is uh, something we, uh, of, we sometimes do, but I think we should always go back to the users and explain them the results of our research but not say, okay, here's the paper we published. Users don't need to read our papers. Let's provide with lay summaries with one page, easy language presentations of what the main findings uh, were. Uh, I see some faces, I said that before because this is one of my obsessions and one of the things I like to, to highlight when we, when we work with users. I'd, I would say that apart from users who are central in our, uh, Transmedia Catalonia uh, research, I think that uh, another element which is central for us is technology, but we are not te technical people, you know what I mean? We are not engineers, we are not technical experts, but 
very often what we are trying to do very often is we are trying to assess the impact of the technology or new technological developments on either the creation of access services or uh, on the interactions of users. So how users access those access services or the actual conception or the actual access services. This is why in our research group, Transmedia Catalonia, uh, many of our projects have been aligned with uh, new technological developments. So for instance, DTV for All, Digital Television for All, in which we were partner, who um, approach access services when we moved from analog to digital television. Uh, HBB for All, uh, another project, another European project, is when we moved to hybrid television, connected television. A more recent one has been IMAC, the Immersive Accessibility Project, again, another European project in which we were partners in this case, in which we approach um, immersive content, virtual reality, more specifically 360 videos. And now we are in this new project, Mediaverse, in which we are dealing with blockchain, blockchain technologies. So it's, it's a challenge for us because of course, I didn't know anything about blockchain technologies uh, half a year ago, okay? Uh, only what I read on the news about cryptocurrencies, which is not exactly what we're doing. Um, I didn't know much about virtual reality before this project, but I think it's good. For me, what's really important is that when a new technology uh, comes up or new research is done on a new technology, we are there with the accessibility, okay? So right from the beginning, we are there and accessibility is considered. Um, that's for me uh, central. And this is very much linked to what Pilar Oredo uh, in this policy paper has referred to as born accessible. So the content is born accessible. This is also related to, for instance, the accessible filmmaking by Pablo Romero Fresco, but we can even go back to Udo and Fels and all the papers they wrote about audio description and how to integrate that from the very beginning. So the whole concept is when there is a technology, even when it's uh, at an early stage or even when in that particular field, it's at an early stage, let's go, let's test, let's see how we deal with accessibility. So in the next few minutes, I will be talking about uh, different projects in which the technological component was important. And I'll start with an old one. Say, so why do you tell us about this old one? Because I like this project very much. And because I think, uh, what we did was quite interesting and innovative at the time. Um, and actually now people are doing this again. And also because I think at the time it was not well understood. Okay, so let me just bear with me five minutes and I'll explain a bit about this. Uh, this project was born um, in 2013, so quite a few years ago. It was funded by a national, uh, by a Spanish call. Um, it lasted three years, I was the main researcher, and the funding was really small. It was one of those years where the crisis was horrible. And I don't remember, but I don't think we got more than 10,000 uh, euros or something like that. So really, really small for three years, but we were passionate about it. And there were two PhD students willing to the research on that. So I'm very, very proud of what we managed. This project was born in a moment in which there was a, a very strong discussion on the use of technologies. There still is right now, but I remember some conferences. I remember, for instance, languages and the media in which uh, there was this very strong discussion on whether audiovisual translation and media accessibility experts should integrate technologies in their, in, their, in their work. I know this is still an ongoing discussion, but I think it was quite fierce at the, at the time. Uh, from a research perspective, I was not pro or against it. I was in favor of researching it, okay? So what we did was we, we did some research on the application of three technologies speech recognition, machine translation, and text-to-speech to two different modes. On the one hand, voiceover. I'm not going to get into that. It was 
voiceover documentaries. That was one of the PhDs I supervised. And then there was another, uh, another area, which was audio description. So what we did with the means we had at the time, so it's not uh, something, now what I mean is that right now the results would definitely be different because the tools have improved. Uh, we tried to, first of all, automatically transcribe English audio descriptions. So the concept was, let me explain that. Can we automatically transcribe the English audio description, translate it automatically, post edit it, and then use a text-to-speech system? Well, let's break it in parts and let's see what happens. So first we looked at the speech recognition. What we did was we took excerpts of uh, an English audio described film. We extra extracted, sorry, the sound. We processed it with a speech activity detection and uh, we extracted the AD units, okay? Um, and we could do that thanks to a process called speaker diarization. Don't ask me much about that. There was a technician dealing with that, okay? But because the speaker was homogeneous, we could identify the AD, AD segments. And then from that, we applied a speech to text transcription. Uh, actually, with the systems we used, which were not specific for AD, uh, where they were more for the news, the results were very low. I have data that I can share with you later. I'm not so sure that the results would be so bad nowadays, but at the moment they were not very good. The performance was slow. Then we looked at the other technology, machine translation, and we had some tests with users. So uh, after uh, uh, a pretest in which we selected the best engine at the time, I will not get into details. So we did the pretest, and okay, this is the best engine that we have at this moment. Um, we had a group of participants doing uh, audio descriptions. So from scratch, creating audio description. The second variable was a human translation of an audio description from English into Catalan. And the third one was post-editing. So we were comparing creation, human translation, and human post-editing. And we assessed that uh, in two different ways. I'm explaining it broadly. On the one hand, we tested for technical, temporal, and cognitive effort. We did that with an input lock. So we could, we had this software input lock that locked everything that uh, our participants were doing. So we calculated the time, the mouse and keyboard effort, and then the pauses. Okay. And this gave us an indication of you know, what was going on from an objective point of view. But we also went to them and asked them about the experience before and afterwards, okay? More or less, I hope you are following me. Basically, three different test conditions, objective data plus subjective data. And the, the fact is that in terms of timing, there were no statistical differences that were significant in any of the, of the three conditions. Um, where, um, the in, in terms of time, okay? In terms of keyboard, of course, the other description creation was more intensive. And in terms of cognitive effort, the AD creation was higher with the objective measures. But then when we talk to the people, uh, one of the main issues with the post editing is that they found it absolutely boring, which doesn't come as a surprise because it's, this is some of the things that are mentioned uh, by professionals and the ratings for the self-reported efforts uh, were really, really bad. Um, which may relate to another aspect that our participants were not trained in post-editing. So there are many, many factors because nobody was trained in post-editing in 2013. So there, it remains to be seen what would happen nowadays. Um, and then the last part, so it's taking me a bit longer, um, was the text to speech. So we did the test with speech recognition, machine translation, and then text to speech. Again, we did a pretest in which we selected the, the best uh, voice. And we had 67 volunteers in this case, listening to four voices one human male, one human female, one artificial voice male, 
one artificial voice female. Uh, the results, uh, we did well, some testing, I will not get into details. Uh, the natural voice, of course, well, of course, got better, uh, better grades, but 94% of the people were willing to accept text-to-speech audio description, considered this a good alternative. And what was quite surprising is that 20% of the people actually preferred a synthetic voice. When they chose that, they didn't know that it was synthetic, okay? So in an anonymous way, when shown these very good voices, 20%, uh, I know it's not a high percentage, but uh, some of them preferred a synthetic voice and some of them even didn't know that it, that was a synthetic voice in that context. Okay, so that's what we did uh, in the ALS project 2013. What would happen today? I don't know. Uh, am I pro or against? I'm a researcher. I'm in pro of researching all these technologies. Um, more recently, I've been involved in the iMac project. Okay, different technology. In this case, and sorry that to be popping so many ideas, uh, but I hope I'm, I'm making myself uh, understood. Um, in this project, uh, we were dealing with immersive environments, 360 videos. Okay, we are used to watching television, uh, cinema on a 2D flat screen. Imagine, I don't know if you've had the experience to put the HMD, the head mounted display, the glasses, and the content is all around you. You've got uh, something happening in 360. How are you going to audio describe that? What are you going to prioritize? How are you going to do an audio description of this content? This was a fascinating challenge. And actually, I had a PhD student, Anita Fidika, who wrote a PhD on the topic. Uh, in the context of the IMAP project, what we did, first we thought, OK, why don't we play with audio? Why don't we play with the sound? Maybe we could use immersive sound uh, as a strategy. So what we tried to do at the beginning is to test the same audio description, but with the sound located in different places. Let me explain that. In one case, it was like a voice of God. So wherever I moved, it was like a voice, sorry for this, a voice around me, okay? The static was that it was someone whispering to my ear, yeah? So if I moved, this person was next to me all the time. The sound came always from here. And then we tried the dynamic, which is, if the, if the action I'm on audio describing is, I don't know, towards my right, the sound of the audio description would come from that place. Are you following me? So we play with different sound positioning. It was a disaster, okay? Uh, at the moment, at the time, who knows now? Uh, people got confused. People got confused. They didn't know where the sound was coming um, and it didn't work. So we did this pre-pilot and we realized that the replies, the qualitative feedback people were giving us was more focused on the scripting. People were really interested in the scripting, not so much in the sound. So for the time being, we didn't develop that further. That's something that, you know, we'll develop it in the future when the technology evolves. We'll see how we deal with that. But then we decided to change and we decided to go uh, and that was done together with RNIB in, in the UK for a classic mode. A classic would be a standard scripting, would, you know, uh, I don't like to use neutral audio description, but you know what I mean, the standard classical type of audio description. Radio was very uh, engaging. Uh, the tone of voice was different. And then uh, we tried a third option, which was an extended audio description. In this case, you were in a 360 virtual world. You are there on your own. You're not doing this experience with someone else. So when I moved and there was something there, you could hear a beep, okay, a sound, an ear con, and then you could click, and this would activate an audio description if you chose to activate this audio description. Um, we did some tests in terms of presence, 
in what context people felt more present, more immersed, okay? And also preferences. Um, in terms of presence, we didn't find uh, any significant um, findings. Although when we compare blind people and persons with sight loss, so partially sighted and blind people, there was a difference. The people who were blind did not feel immersed and actually they were quite bothered with the, with the whole setting, what's the use of it, if you know what I mean? So it was quite complex. Uh, in terms of preferences, it was quite, it was quite balanced. In the case of Barcelona, many, many people chose as the first preference the extended. They liked very, very much this possibility of clicking on and then have a more extended audio description that you can choose. Um, so this is an example. Um, you, all the papers are published. So if any of these things are, is interesting to you, email me, I will share the papers and then you can get in more details. But this is to show, you know, something new. How do we deal with it? We test it. It fails. It doesn't matter. We test something else. And then the technology will evolve and we'll test something else. Okay. Um, in this project, we also tested interaction. So, oh, it's fantastic to have uh, an audio description in 360, but what if people cannot access the audio description? So we were testing voice uh, menus, voice interactions. And then we also found some interesting results about the expectations. How do you talk to a machine? You know, I remember some of the people saying, I would like to use more natural language, more you know, uh, not having to say always these words. But again, if you talk to Siri or if you talk to one of these machines, there are certain rules that you need to follow, okay? Um, and uh, so, yes, we tested this and we also tested not only this uh, consumption and access to the access service, but also the creation. So we had some tests, two iterations of tests with audio describers using a specific software for audio description in 360. We had uh, 24 and 24 people, and we did some usability testing about the tool. And we were testing, uh, again, you know, the different functionalities. Here, the, one of the main problems is that most audio describers, or many audio describers, are not used to software. So that was a challenge. With subtitling, we didn't have that problem. With audio description, it was a challenge because many of them just work with a word, uh, word processor. And that was a challenge. And also depending on the country, uh, some audio describers don't do the recording, some do, okay? So again, uh, this was also a challenge. So you really need to know, you know, who the users are, the experience, et cetera, to, to understand. Uh, the data. And our, our latest challenge is this blockchain technology, which sounds very fancy. You say that in a talk and it's fantastic, but it's really, really, uh, uh, it's really challenging and we are learning a lot. I thought that now it would be a good moment. Let's see if it works. Bear with me. It's one minute, 50 seconds, because the video will explain it better than I do what this project is about. Okay. Uh, let's see. And I'm not sure if you'll hear the sound. That's what I don't know if I did right. Let, let's check, check. Could you hear the sound? No. Then there will, oh, there are subtitles. There is a sort of transcript subtitles. Uh, let's try, okay.
Okay. Um, so we, you would you probably wonder how do you add the accessibility layer in this project? Well, the, the video was not accessible. I have to admit that. Um, in in this project, as I said, there are three use cases. One use case is uh, citizen journalism. So imagine you are in a demonstration, you take photos and then you can upload them in this platform and you can say what copyrights you will assign to that. You can monetize that. Um, so you are in a way in control of this content that you are creating. The third use case is about artistic experience. And the second case is the one uh, UAB is dealing, which is co-creating co 360 videos. So the videos, you know, IMAC, that's a bit the continuation. Uh, so co-creating 360 videos, uh, in many cases for social inclusion. How do we add the accessibility layer here? Um, we are working on two different aspects right now. Oh, excuse me. Um, in this Mediaverse platform, let me try you, uh, to explain that, uh, users will be able to create and share that content. Imagine you have a video and instead of posting it on social media, you go to this platform that we are developing in this platform, you have tools to create a video. For instance, you will have a 360 video editor. Okay, you will have a tool to create uh, yeah, videos, so to speak. And there is also a tool to create subtitles for 2D videos, etc. And then people will be able to upload it, share it with all the community and decide what the others can do with your content. So you may want to say anyone can use it or you may want to get money out of it, you can assign the copyright, okay? That's to the best of my understanding. So what we are trying to research now, and this is still an ongoing discussion, is could we maybe include accessibility in the chain? How to include accessibility on the chain? If someone produces a content in this blockchain environment, how can we add an accessibility layer to the chain? maybe to an existing content, we can add subtitles, audio descriptions, and monetize these audio descriptions and these subtitles. This is something that we are discussing now, and in a half a year, I hope to have go back to you with the focus groups that we'll be doing soon, okay? But it's an example of how we are addressing this new technology. But there are also very different approaches to, to deal with accessibility with this new uh, technologies and with the co-creation process. Another totally different thing we are doing, and these are just examples to see, you know, how we can put, how we can have accessibility almost anywhere. Uh, as part of this uh, Mediaverse project, we are co-creating videos, as I said, with vulnerable ch children. So we went to the, the Autonomy, my university has a foundation that offers these activities to children in our area in the afternoons. There is a facilitator who is a student from our university and they do activities with the children. Oh, sorry, I put my alarm. Um, and um, we went to them and proposed an activity related to Mediaverse. We said, okay, we have this new platform. We have the tools to co-create 360 videos. Can we do that with the children? And they love the idea. And this is what, what we are doing now. But then what do we do in terms of accessibility? We reuse this activity to raise awareness about accessibility. So with the children, what we will be doing, and I'm really fascinated about this, we'll get into this, you know, they are 12 years old or something like that. We'll say, okay, uh, today, you know, the first day, now we are gonna record, um, the school, for instance, and do two small interviews with your headmaster and a teacher, for instance. And I'm sure the children will be fascinated with the 360, with the camera and everything, because we are all are, we all are with the new technologies. Then we've got these videos recorded from a person who, who's blind and says, hey, listen, I've been told that you've created a wonderful video, but I have a problem. I cannot see the video. Let's find a solution, okay? And in this way, they will learn about audio description. The same with the, the hearing loss, 
even the signing where they will sign to say thank you, hello, a very short uh, sentence. And the last day, we, they will have this co-created video. Hopefully, hopefully they will have fun with this, okay? And they will learn, they will learn about accessibility. So this is a way in which we are integrating technology. Uh, the last part of my talk, do I have 10 minutes still? Yes, I think it's fine. Yeah, it's okay, um, don't worry, it's okay. Um, it's, we, so I, I, I mentioned that we try to follow always a technological path, but we're always trying to find something innovative uh, driving our research. And one of the, yes, quite innovative ideas uh, we've had lately relates to the concept of easy language in audiovisual translation and media accessibility. I'm sorry, because now I see uh, Andrea, who's heard about this a thousand times, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'll explain about this. In this, uh, this project, which finished last August, and which I'm very proud to say that it was selected as a best practice by the European Commission, uh, we, we investigated the integration of easy to understand language with different access services. Uh, it was inspired by the works of uh, Bernabe Caro, Pilar Orero, etc. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, there are different types of easy to understand language. So we can have easy to read on your left with images, short sentences, specific vocabulary, etc. Or you can have a less simplified mode, which is plain language. Uh, even without reading on the right, you see before and after and just you know, the, the presentation of the information and probably the lexical choice um, makes the text easier. But, but our idea was, can we merge this you know, easy to understand language with audio description? So, and this was, I think, quite innovative. I have not heard much about it. Um, so we had some focus groups um, and we had experts, audio describers and experts sorry, in easy to understand language. And um, they, there was this very interesting discussion in which, and I apologize for the typo there, I'm just standing slippery, um, in which they found that many aspects are shared. They said, we're using short, simple sentences. And they said, oh, we also do. We only use one word per one reference. Oh, we also do. That's what they said. Is that so? We'll see. Okay. Um, however, there was this challenge to say, okay, maybe we create an easy audio description, but maybe uh, persons with sight loss would think that this is patronizing. Uh, another thing is, does it make sense to have easy audio descriptions in complex films? So they, they were considering some of them, maybe, you know, the user profile is different. Maybe we could go for something different, uh, like, you know, maybe an audio introduction that explains the content, et cetera, et cetera. Was, those were initial descriptions. Based on some of the things that were said with uh, Blanca Arias Badia, we did uh, some research and we analyzed nine, nine uh, audio described films in Catalan. We presented that in the last languages and the media. And uh, hopefully the paper will be published. Well, we'll be finished soon because we're almost finishing that, but the, the, the presentation was done. And we actually found that in Catalan, the audio descriptions are quite simple in terms of, you know, close to the easy language recommendations. So normally it's simple clauses, a neuter syntactic order, general lexicon, no figurative language, no foreign words, no neology. Even we did some calculations and the complexity was quite low. I'm not sure if it's the same in other languages. Actually, I have some doubts in certain languages. So this is why we are doing some work uh, with Blanca, hopefully to present it in the next uh, languages and the media. While doing all this research, I came up with this concept of audio description para intelectuales, audio description for intellectuals, literally, which is something, I don't know, Sabine, if you knew about it, uh, uh, it's uh, something that they do in uh, Argentina. So we were not so innovative, okay? Uh, you know, <laughs> innovative ideas grow in different places. Actually, and this Analia Gutierrez was telling me, 
In Argentina, in an act from 2009, and I'm just sure if many of you know about it, they have this concept of audio description para intelectuales, which is an audio track whose content is transferred into simplified language. So a language with a basic grammar, again, a type of sorry, structure, not long and without technical terms. And they use it for institutional and public service information. Maybe afterwards at home, you want to watch this. Uh, there is a link to the Spanish uh, version. The problem is that this is not well established. And Anya was telling me that, you know, how this is done, it's not clear at this stage. Um, another experience related to this was the easy audios that were done in Spain at a certain point, which was not for blind people, it was for persons with uh, cognitive disabilities mainly. Uh, an easy language was used to explain what was going on, but the person that we interviewed for the, there is a link then if you click on audio files on top, we had this interview as part of the Easy project with the person doing that and leading that. And he said there were so many similarities with audio description. So they used to a certain extent the Spanish standard on AD. So again, it's different, but there are so many things which are uh, shared. And yeah, I invite you to watch that, that interview because it's, it's, a new, it's a new concept. So uh, this idea of easy audios, uh, so sorry, from this idea of easy audio descriptions, we evolved a bit to this concept of easy audios. So this is what I'm working right now. And since I'm working on this right now, I don't have any answers yet. Uh, so um, could we talk about a new access service for those who struggle to understand audiovisual content? Uh, probably yes, but we have many open questions and this is ongoing research. Um, the relationship between this audio description for intellectuals, the easy obvious, and even with, I don't know if you've heard about easy interpreting that happens in certain contexts, which is also called simultaneous simplification, for instance, so what is the relationship between all these oral, auditory transfer modes with a simplification component? This is something I'm, I'm working on right now. Uh, what are the specific characteristics of the, of the easy audios? What user needs are we addressing? And is this really useful if we go for these easy audios? I'm not saying that easy audios needs to replace audio descriptions. I'm not saying that at all, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, if you go back to my, one of my first slides, we've considered persons with sight loss, we've considered persons with hearing loss, or persons who cannot access the video, persons who cannot access the audio, to use a better terminology, persons who cannot understand the language, but maybe there is an, a service that can help us uh, or can help the people who have trouble or have difficulties to access the content. And this may be something worth exploring. Um, well, I hope that my talk made some sense. I think I've tried to address users. Users are central for, for our research. I've tried to explain how technology has been a driven force in our, in our research and also how, you know, uh, we need to be brave in a way, uh, try different things. If they work, fantastic. If they don't work, that, I mean, we are lucky to be researchers and things cannot work. We can take risks. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it. As a final thought, Let's not forget, forget about networking and sharing our knowledge. Uh, I'm part of ALMA. I invite you to, to check the webpage, which is a national network of uh, audiovisual translation and media accessibility, in, in this case, in non-hegemonic languages. But I'm also involved uh, in the Lead Me Cost Action. If you are not familiar with that, keep an eye, because we are offering very interesting um, summer and winter schools on media accessibility and there will be opportunities for pre-docs, post-docs and early, you know, early stage researchers. All the disclaimers that I'm not going to read, you've got the link and everything's there online and thank you very much for your attention.
and for being still here at 6.30, well, 5.30 for you, right? <laughs> And for bearing with me, I, I, I'm sure that if I had done this talk early in the morning, I would be more lively, but at this hour, that's the maximum I could reach. I'm, I'm open to questions, comments, uh, anything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I think it, I wouldn't have noticed that it wasn't the morning, so <laughs> brilliant. Um, no, really, really, really interesting overview. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, I'm going to throw this open for questions, comments. Um, we can, if you like, start with any kind of clarification questions. Um, if there was anything that you think uh, need to be clarified, I, I, I think I didn't really say much at the beginning. I wasn't sort of quite sure how familiar everybody here is with all the description, but I think it's become clear um, throughout your talk and also the link between all the description and um, other methods to improve um, accessibility for all. So you, I think I found that really interesting how you've also um, pointed to uh, yeah, the, the good old subtitles and what have you. So throwing this open for questions then, or comments. Yes, or or comments, I don't, very comments. informal. You see that yeah. I'm not a very formal person. So, mm -hmm. or if you have any experiences, if someone is doing research and wants to mm -hmm. share, really just go ahead. Yes. Um, Anyone? Hi. I uh, see faces. Yes, good. Hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, Professor Matamala. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Nice to uh, see you. Uh, really good to see you. Uh, I'm Kang Te Luo from City University of Hong Kong. So I have a question regarding um, the users' reception studies on users in studying media accessibility. So what interests me is about the individual differences within the user groups. So I think um, uh, isn't, I, I assume that it might be a little bit risky to uh, regard the whole user group as the homogeneous group in conducting reception studies because many factors such as their educational background, their personal preferences, or even their, uh, uh, so many factors would influence their personal kind of perceptions. So how to address that in the reception studies? Thank you. This is, this is so tricky. Um, the first thing is we need to find, you know, let, let me try to, to explain that. Uh, the first thing when we involve users, um, all those factors that you were mentioning can have an effect on the results, and that's for sure. So we aim at the homo homogeneous, I cannot say that word, uh, sample. But those of us who've worked with persons with disabilities know that this is not easy at all. I mean, it's not even easy to get 30 people involved in a research. Um, so there we do the best we can, to be honest, okay? Uh, but then we try to have some, identify some elements that can help us identify trends, okay, when we do our analysis. Um, there, we have another problem, which I found more recently. What can we ask our participants? Anything that we ask our participants is personal data. So if we ask for that personal data, we really need to need that personal data for our research. So if I'm asking about, I don't know, uh, gender, or if I'm asking about race, or if I'm asking about whatever, how am I going to use uh, those data? Because we need to be very uh, protective and sensitive of everybody's uh, data. So in that regard, we need to find uh, a balance. I don't know if I replied to you. There's not an Thank you. answer for that. I agree, Anna. <laughs> it's, it's not... A, a, to be honest, some of my students, to get 30 uh, persons with sight loss, imagine 30 persons with sight loss doing a test with virtual reality. The logistics of that is amazingly difficult. If we put more restrictions, then it's, it's gonna be even more difficult. Our tests, for instance, we often go to the user associations because mm -hmm. people have to move to our premises at the university, which are half an hour or 45 minutes from, uh, from the city center, we won't get uh, the users. So there we can, we need to find a balance. 
Thank you very much. Andrea, um, well, I, I have a question in relation to the virtual reality, but I hold back. Andrea, why don't you uh, ask a question? Yes, I, I have a question. Hi, Anna. Sorry, sorry. Um, I feel sorry. You've, you've texted me, um, but... Uh, or explain. <laughs> or explain sorry. something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you're working with this, yeah. Andrea. Yes, I am working with, with Sabine, as, as you know, um, on um, audio description in easy language. Um, our idea is it's similar to what we did with EASIT, but, but different. Um, the idea is taking an audio description and then changing it and making it for people with cognitive impairment, but adding extra elements to the audio description. So it's not only about the visuals, but it's also about, let's say, social interaction jokes that are in the, in the movie, for example. And I wonder whether you're trying to do the same thing uh, yes. now with Bob. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, Easy Audios for me is not only about describing what's happening, it's mm -hmm. uh, making sense of the whole thing. Um, so this is what I'm trying to work on, on this concept of Easy Audios, how through audio, through an audio explanation, so to speak, you mm -hmm. can make a content uh, easier to, to understand. And then, yeah, that's and also on the concept of easy audio descriptions i'm also interested in seeing to what extent audio descriptions are easy right now in different languages and how simplifying them can have an impact on audiences i'm not sure if people would welcome them more or less and i, I just as we'll have a phd student soon who won a, a scholarship this you know last month so we'll start doing that research very, very soon. I mean, she needs to join us this this month, I hope. Yeah, that would be interesting as a, as a sort of follow up also to see whether there is something to join forces because I can see also lots of, um, as Andrea is saying, you know, lots of questions in this space, um, uh, which audience, you know, would like to have which type of um, description or assistive commentary and is there overlap, is there, is there something that can be generated in common, um, you know, sort of with a common element oh. of it? And so, and then of One. course, this this point whether it's language specific and to what extent, you know, this is language specific. I mean, we already see, and you know this, I guess, Anna, um, if you even look, um, I'm generalizing a little bit, but if you even look at the styles of British made yes. English auto description and US yeah, auto yeah, description, yeah, yeah. there are even differences. I guess it's, I don't know how the situation in Spain is, but, but and in other Spanish speaking countries. Um, uh, so, so yes, this is um, yes, an interesting yeah. emerging field. We, we also have in some plans in this field. So, so maybe this is really something we should, yeah. we should discuss the, a bit more. Hmm. The, the Catalan audio descriptions, for instance, are not as complex as the mm. British ones. I'm mm -hmm. absolutely convinced mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. but we will have data uh, okay. this year. And then mm -hmm. what we are also doing is, mm -hmm. uh, and this is ongoing because there is a PhD student working on that, um, easy language or easy to understand language uh, is based on a series of recommendations. So there are the inclusion, inclusion Europe uh, guidelines, for instance, mm -hmm. there is the IFLA guidelines uh, for easy to read, yeah? so the easy language. There is also um, an ISO standard that I'm co-editing, which is uh, being done. But some of these recommendations actually do not have uh, scientific empirical research backing it up. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the problems. We say these type of sentences work better because we've always said that, okay? And because it's been inherited from one book or one guideline to another. And now, uh, my P Mariona uh, Gonzalez, uh, the PhD student I'm supervising, um, is doing precisely that. First of all, uh, she's done a systematic lead review on on this topic on you know how many articles can you find backing up easy language recommendations um, on the making so I'm I'm not gonna disclose the, the results let's put some tension and maybe in half a year the, the article is published and the next step for her and this has not started but it's designed is to test some of these recommendations to see if they really make uh, a difference or not because that's what we need but that's from the at the written uh, she's staying mariona is staying at the written level and then marina my new phd student will 
move into the oral. And that's where my area of research is going now, which in a way, if you look at it, is this concept that the Germans, uh, our colleague Christiane Maas is always using, you know, this concept of accessible communication. And in fact, I think this is what we're doing. Translation in a way is accessible communication. All your description, all this subtitling, all this is accessible communication. Mm. Yeah, I think we have uh, we have a lot of interesting overlap there um, um, of, as of late. So I didn't quite realize how much you also moved into this one. Um, would be good to chat uh, more about that at some point, just um, you know, to maybe to coordinate it even also. Um, yeah, 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 we were also thinking of organizing uh, sort of a smaller event around that at some point. So that's all good. But I'm um, sorry, I'm still holding back my own question because I see Constantine has his hand up there. Go on. Oh, yeah. I don't hear you, Constantine. It doesn't look yeah, about now. Oh, no, now, now, now. Yes. Yeah, this this computer sometimes um, misbehaves. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the talk. It's, it was very interesting, and um, yeah, obviously, given my background, I was particularly interested in in the part about uh, using that the blockchain. So I don't know how far you are with that, but uh, I thought it's quite um, fascinating that the idea of being able to tag your translation, your, your contribution, and um, I wonder whether. It, you had the chance to look at um, the impact of this on uh, collaborative translation or this kind of okay. co collaborative work or you are planning to go this direction? We, uh, we are planning um, focus groups in April, April, uh, May on this topic. So I disclose something which is really, really new. The project started uh, one year ago, okay? So we just moved into this very, very recently. And to be honest, I'm learning about this. So I'm not an expert in blockchain. I'm not an expert in any of these things. I would fear a question about the technology behind, but we've got experts, all the technical people. And now we need to, we are gonna have focus group with translators uh, on how to approach this and how they see you know, the possibilities. And then we'll see where that takes us. So I'm sorry, I don't have any more Thank you. input well, at this stage. But I'll it's really, really space. new, this, this, yes. But because I know that um, this idea is being circulated in yes. uh, various, various um, fields, various areas of being able to say, this is my contribution. This is uh, yeah, what it's about. Yeah, hard and adding for. like different layers, no? Yeah. So, and with the blocks, you, this is like distributed. And this information is shared, and you know who did what, etc. But yeah, it's it's still at least for us to be to be fully researched. Where uh, my colleague in this case, Anna Fernandez, is the one leading this. As I said, it's teamwork. I'm not doing all these things; otherwise, I would be crazy. <laughs> Andrea, um, I have a question about the immersive sound uh, experience that you organized for the EMAC. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I heard uh, José Neves talking about sound experiences for a museum in Brazil. So basically, she created the other description and then she added um, songs, music, uh, people acting out other characters along the, um, you know, in the other description. And they integrated that and it, made, it, it became a work of art rather than just an audio description. And I wonder what you think about sound experiences. Would it be interesting? Sound, sound, sound is central for audio description, and we have not explored, explored half of, of the possibilities there. Uh, when I was talking about sound in iMac, that was different. It was ambi sound, so sound positioning. Uh, but in fact, when we did the extended audio descriptions, we added some background sound there, you know, to, to make it more engaging in a way. And then there is uh, Mariana Lopez in the UK doing lots of research on the on the topic. So sound definitely is a, a key topic in audio description to which we have not paid that much attention. I think we have paid a lot of attention to the description per se and to the sound part not. In our case, I didn't refer to it here. What we've, I've done some work with Maria Machuca on prosody. Okay, and I didn't explain it today. But for the last three years in a smaller project, we've looked 
uh, I know it's not sound, but it's the voice, the sound of the voice, right? And, and we've looked at uh, what people consider neutral, because sometimes you say the voicing has to be neutral. Okay, what does neutral mean? What is a neutral audio description? We had this research in which we asked people uh, to choose the most neutral voice. So that there was a test, they selected different voices, their preferred voice, and then what they consider neutral. And it was, well, the results are published. I can share that if anyone is interested on prosody. But uh, it was quite interesting to see what neutral, the qualitative. I was very much interested in the qualitative. So some people related to that to a, uh, without inflection. Others, maybe to the accent. Others, even to the language. When you say, no, no, it's a prosody, but they related to the content. So it was quite interesting to see, to see that. All this, sorry, I talk too much. To say that, yes, it's not only about what we the content selection and the wording. It's also about the words, how they are said, the prosody and the sounds. And, and the sound that, mix, Andrea, the sound mm -hmm. mix. There was Alicia Rodriguez who did the PhD. How many audio descriptions have a horrible sound mix? Mm -hmm. And the experience is ruined because of that. Well, a few, I think, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you get the chance to ask uh, participants what they thought of the extended AD, whether they liked the sound effects yes. or not? Uh, concerning the sound effects specifically, I don't recall if there were any answers to that. Concerning extended audio description, yes. Uh, and actually for the, cut, the, the participants from Barcelona, it was the first preferred option. Uh, they found it, I'm looking at my notes, eh? uh, they found it uh, innovative and they liked very much the fact that they could choose. This, you know, being able to choose when you want and when, yeah, when you want to activate it, that, that was good. Actually, here we could think about different layers of information. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I think. Different layers, mm. uh, depending on the user needs. That's something mm. that is also the yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes, that's something we've been thinking about. Um, uh, these different user needs, and that that could become part of this extension idea. Um, that was sort of my question went in this similar direction. Um, when uh, how did they how did they really know um, how they can trigger? this extension because did, did they sort of because you said they can click somewhere so did they there was just sort a, of click there was in a, a direction? sound yeah there was when you looked at a certain because of your head movement when you looked at a certain position yeah. there was an ear icon like a sound indicator like a beep okay okay and then you knew that there it was like if it was like a hot spot that mm -hmm. you activate but instead of a visual hot spot it was an audio hot spot mm -hmm. But so this is then, um, sorry, I'm not trying to um, pick any holes in it, not at all. I'm, I'm, in, I'm really interested in this, um, how it works in a, in a 360 world. I'm, I've, you know, long interest in 3D environments and, and I, I've um, sort of thinking about how AD can work there. I think, as you also said, this is really challenging to um, how people even get into this world. And um, so it was then quite it was steered by their head movements. And so it wasn't steered by any anything within the AD where they say, oh, now I would like to have more of the set, more of that information or something like that. No, no. But then if they wanted more and on yeah. that place there was this sound, they could click with a, I don't know, remote, how you call that? Yeah, sound, yes. And this, activate yeah. the audio also, description. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are many challenges, Selena, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. the, with the 360. Mm -hmm. But for me, one of the challenges is that I think that um, narration in 360 is still not fully developed. Mm -hmm. So we are like, you know, at the beginning where there were black and white films and we watch them and the, the way they are structured, the film construction is, you can feel that it's at the beginning that people are trying to find a language. Mm -hmm. I think that the language of, of virtual reality is still in the making. Uh, and we don't know about that language yet, not even us. Mm. Um, it's like, you know, the first films were about people going out of a, of a factory or a train that 
what is virtual reality? Many very often is the roller coasters. So mm -hmm. sometimes I see many similarities. And mm -hmm. there is a very interesting article by Anita Fidika, my PhD student, in which she was thinking about film lang about yeah, the the narratology mm -hmm. of 2D films when you move that into 360 mm -hmm. and how that, that impacts audio description. There are no film cuts. So yes. it's it's different. So the construction is simply mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And well, it's also because know. everybody has, in a way, a different way of navigating to those environments. There isn't really a more or less linear or whatever. And films are also not linear. But um, um, if you watch a film, a, a traditional film, everybody sees the same thing. In a, in yes. a 3D environment, right. you, you go to it and uh, everybody goes to it in a different way. Yes. That's, that's it's... what I think is also really challenging, how you then package that into description. So that's why I was interested, of course, in your approach to say you can you can click here or you can turn and but that's also Yeah. Strange. I remember yeah. one of the people in the focus group, I think it was uh, in in Krakow that we did one, mm -hmm. was like we want to choose our own path, they said. No, you remember that mm -hmm. uh, yeah that that was so we, we don't know many of these mm -hmm. things. We also know how this will evolve virtual reality, mm -hmm. because virtual reality can be 360. It can be, uh, you know, really in full immersive, you know, uh, with unity and, and but it can also be augmented reality. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've tried the HoloLens, mm -hmm. you try them early and they're amazing. So, mm -hmm. well, yes, I'm different. sorry, we yeah. don't have many. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Like, no, no, another no. thing is that some, some people said, I don't want to wear the, the head mounted display. There's no mm -hmm. point in that. So mm. maybe that should be more a sound experience mm. rather than yeah. the, you know, why do you have to wear mm. a bulky head mounted display when you're not mm. enjoying it? Maybe mm. it can be, you know, an immersive audio experience. Mm. Mm. Yeah, many, many questions there on that one. Yes. Translating virtual reality into, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are there, are there any other comments, questions on this? Um, so we've been uh, sort of getting passionate about the virtual reality. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I try to explain a bit of different things. So I hope mm -hmm. you can yeah. take something home. And uh, you've got my email on my presentation. So if someone wants to email me later, I'll try my best to, to reply and share the information. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very good. Well, if there aren't any other questions, given that we are close to seven o'clock at your end, um, yes. we, I think we better <laughs> we better let you go. Um, thank you. That's right. Thank you very much, Anna. It was very insightful. And thank you for sharing all this. And I, I also thought it was really interesting the, <clears throat> to contextualize this a bit, how we do research in this sensitive field. And um, so I hope that also gave people beyond their own research interests some um, uh, some interesting steers and thanks for sharing it all open source wonderful thank you very much okay, nice. thank you can i take a picture if people of put course. the cameras on if someone wants if someone doesn't want to be on the picture to just uh okay i am i doing it right uh yes come on smile <laughs> <laughs> first page and i'll go to the second Okay. Thank you very much. That's all. Good.